Hello everyone, welcome to the Book Cafe. I'm here in I'm here with Mr. Mike Cole, the author of the Shadow Ops series and uh, the new Sacred Throne trilogy, of which the second book is coming out soon. October. October. Um, if you may recall, we the last uh, we reviewed um, Mr. Cole's The Armored Saint, first book of the Sacred Throne, a few weeks back, and the link to that will be at the end of the video. Um, and uh, so Welcome, if you'd like to introduce yourself a little bit. Hi, well, thanks for having me. Um, Mike Cole, uh, welcome to my apartment where we are we are set up. It's a 500 square foot shoe box in Brooklyn, so this is a very hipster interview. And it is full of books. It is full of books, yeah. I mean, all around here, I ripped out the crown molding, because if you're going to have books in a 500 square foot apartment, the only way to do it is to go up. So there, um, my entire crown molding is nothing but a giant bookshelf. Uh, and if you hear strange noises, it's probably the cat. Yeah, it's my cat, um, <laughs> who uh, who many of you may know from Twitter. Her full name is Al Fuck. What the fuck did you do that for? I wasn't even fucking touching you. And we call her Al Fuck for short. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, so Mr. Cole is uh, famous for being simultaneously a member of the military and a very successful fantasy author. Um, so. I think we should start off uh, questions with that. So you've described yourself as a nerd who works for the military, and you've advocated that writers join the military. Um, so let's take this question in two parts. Uh, when did you conclude you were a nerd, and why did you reach that conclusion, mm -hmm. aside from all of the gaming paraphernalia? Right. Um, and did you always want to work for the military? So um, I think I always knew I was a nerd. I, I think I had all of the classic nerd... Um, I don't know, uh, idiosyncrasies. Um, I had a tough time coming up socially. Um, I know shit, actually. I assume it's okay to curse on here because I've been doing it like a sailor from the beginning. Uh, I've been trying to avoid it. I might be able to find a way to bleep it out. <laughs> okay, good luck. <laughs> uh, I'll do my best to keep control of it, but I do swear like a sailor because I've been a sailor for many years. <laughs> that makes sense. In the Coast Guard. Um, so, uh, you know, I had a tough time making friends. I had a tough time... Um, getting dates. I had a tough time adjust, adjusting socially. Um, I completely understand right, that. Right, as most of us do growing up. Uh, my parents were, I mean, look, this is not taking anything away from them. They did the best that they could, but they, they didn't really raise me. I kind of had to figure it out. Um, and I, I think when you're little and you don't understand how to get along with people, um, it can be super scary because um, people react badly to you because you, you fumble your efforts at being social. I, I completely understand right. where you're coming from. I've been there. Right, yeah. exactly. And it becomes really frightening. Um, and so what do you do? You look for role models that aren't scared um, because you are constantly scared. And um, when your parents aren't providing that for you, well, those role models are, where, are, are people who project violent power in comic books, fantasy novels in D&D. &D. I remember reading the basic book, uh, God, I can't believe I'm saying this, but you're probably too young to remember this. Um, the basic book for D&D, &D, when, it, when it first came out, the first edition, was a, a sort of a sepia tone, blue and white paperback cover. And it was a Dave Trampier painting of a red dragon, um, of course, white on this cover, with a wizard casting a spell out. The dragon's on a pile of gold. The wizard's casting a spell out from one corner. And there's a knight in full plate armor with a longbow, um, you know, attacking it from the other corner. And here are two fantasy characters facing a giant, horrific monster, and they're not scared at all. And looking at that, and looking at Wolverine, and Cyclops, and Superman, and Batman, and Frodo, and Taran, uh, the assistant pig keeper, and all of that, it was those kind of fantasy characters that sort of taught me how to be an adult. Um, and how to deal with fear. And um, so it was kind of inevitable, I think, that I would go to the military. And kind of inevitable when you take these two threads that I have this nerd background and this sort of, I don't know, raised by violent stereotypes, that those two things would merge into the kind of fiction I write. Um, and I was, uh, so who is, who is one of your biggest role models? You've got a lot of uh, Captain America paraphernalia yeah, around here, sure. but I noticed you didn't mention him in your, uh, in your little yeah. Just there. yeah, and that's on purpose, um, and it was funny, uh, you mentioned that I said in that article before that um, I thought all writers should join the military. I wrote that um, when Obama was president, uh, 
And Donald Trump is now president. Um, so for me, seeing the stars and stripes is really painful. Um, and having Captain America as my role model is really painful because I feel like, look, you can see this tattoo, this Douglas MacArthur speech, duty on our country. I don't know if it's in frame there. Uh, yeah. But I believe this stuff. Right? I believe this stuff. I believe it enough to ink it on my skin permanently. Um, and since Trump's election, I, you know, I feel like I've been a chump, I've been a sucker, and that uh, all that stuff is. Uh, I was the only one taking it seriously. So yeah, I mean, I'll never chuck Cap. I'll never put him aside. But I got to admit, I approach that with pretty mixed feelings these days. Well, um, to be fair, I've always seen interpretations of him that you know Cap defends the America as it should be, not necessarily the America as it is. That's the whole concept of civil wars. This is so funny. It's one of the big arguments I get. A lot of my friends hate crossovers um, or hate like. Sidebar comic series like Civil War, yeah. but that's one of the reasons why I love the Civil War storyline so much. Is exactly that that Cap's the guy who's standing up for for what it should be. Um, on good days I can remember that, and on bad days I went a little. Um, so you mentioned um, that. So you said just now that that uh, it was inevitable that the the nerd and the military things would blend. Um, so they weren't always related? Did, they, did that come about um, before or after you joined? Um, well, I mean, the military found a way to focus an instinct I think I had my whole life. It's funny. Before all my friends had kids, I'm not a father myself, but before all my friends had kids, I used to believe that children come out as a blank slate and grow based on the experiences they have and become who they are based on their environment and what they experience. And now that all my friends have kids and I'm really spending time with kids and my brother has kids, I'm realizing that that's not true at all. Kids come out pre-baked. Um, there is something of who they are, a lot of who they are, right out of the gate. And you're just refining that with experience as time goes on. I believe that now. So I do feel like some allele was turned on in my DNA from the moment I was born telling me that I was a fighter, a protector. Um, and when you're a Jewish kid growing up in the suburbs of New York, that's, those are not instincts that are honored or accepted. My parents, you know, what do you do? You become a dentist, you become a lawyer, you read books, you don't go to the gym, you don't exercise, you certainly don't get in fights. That's not okay. <laughs> um, and I remember feeling this weird sense of disconnection of not being who I was. And it wasn't until 9-11 happened and, I, and society sort of gave me permission to upend my life and run into professional violence um, that I realized, my God, it was like coming home. This is what I was meant to do all along. Um, so, <laughs> moving on from that, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned, so you mentioned, uh, you've mentioned in at least one interview that you actually wrote um, while you were on tour in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, so, I imagine that must not have. I imagine that can't have been a normal writing process. What what was that? What was so, that like? So uh, it was pretty cool um, and pretty bizarre. Uh, and actually, this is a good nerd story. You'll like this. Um, uh, I got rocketed when I was playing. I think it was you said Elder Smarrow and Skyrim. Four. Oh. Yeah, four. Oh. Oblivion. So you know the Oblivion. Story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got rocketed in the middle of that um, and went flying out of my hooch um, with like in my tidy whities <laughs> with like 107s touching down about 80 yards away. Which 107? 107 millimeter rockets. So, oh, dear um, God. And uh, it didn't, one touchdown probably about 80 yards away, which, I mean, it sounds like a big distance. It's not. Um, and I probably would have been killed, but it didn't go off. It certainly felt like it went off, but it didn't go off. Um, and uh, I ran into the bunker, um, and I had, there were actual killers in the bunker. I was an intelligence officer, so. You know, I certainly was armed and was trained, but it wasn't my job to go put warheads on foreheads, so to speak. That was not, you know. But those guys are in the bunker with me as I get in there, in my tidy whities with mud shellacked up one side of my body. And um, we had cell phones that we used to do call chaining, um, and we weren't supposed to give the numbers out. And, of course, I immediately gave it to everybody uh, in my family. And uh, <laughs> the phone rang, literally in the middle of a rocket attack, in the bunker, and it was my mom. <laughs> So I, I doubt she knew that was happening. What did no, you say? No. Well, she did. She did this great thing where uh, you know she said, uh, "I'm going to talk for five minutes, and you're not allowed to interrupt me." And then proceeded to 
you know, vent about how upset she was that I was in a rocket. That's <laughs> the middle of a rocket. Wall rockets, right. right. And I'm going, Mom, Mom, Mom. And these guys who just killed, like, five people that morning are looking at me like... Oh. Right. So, like, this... So, you asked me what it's like riding in a rock. Like, it was... That, and it's ridiculous. Every, war makes everything completely surreal. Writing, gaming. But I do want to point out that, like, I still got my oblivion in. Yeah. You know. So, um... So what was what was the writing process like? You know, when when did you find time to write? When did you? You make time. Um, I mean, the op tempo in Iraq is insane. Uh, you know, we're talking eighteen hour days. Your sleep rhythms are destroyed. We had these. Um, uh, I mean, literally, you will work. You know, if there's an op going on, you know, and there's people fighting, and I'm in, in a in a fusion cell, you know, providing tactical ground intelligence to these guys or vectoring in assets to help them. You can't go. Well, put in time. Time to go to bed. You know. Yeah. You know, if you've been up for 18 hours, you drink, so we have these things called rippets. So you know Red Bull is. Yes. So rippets are like distilled Red Bull. Oh, jeez. It's like nitrogen, like nitro fuel, nitrous oxide. And we had them in these little, um, they're, they're like half the size of a Red Bull. They're like this big. Um, and we would just pound these things all day. Um, and that's what I did. I would come home after, you know, home. I, you know, I lived in a, basically a shipping container surrounded by sandbags. But I would come back to them. One good thing is we had no distractions. I didn't have anybody to hang out with. I didn't have parties to go to or leisure things to do. Um, and I, I think war focuses you. And I think realizing that you could die at any moment kind of helps you focus on what's important. Um, so I was used to drinking rippets and not sleeping. So I drank rippets and I didn't sleep and I wrote. Um, so is that when you wrote the first Shadow Ops book? Yeah, that's when I wrote Control Point. Well, I mean, I'd already written it, I think, three times before I went to Iraq. Um, but uh, um, I kept tearing it down and rewriting it. Before I went um, on my third tour, um, Pete, Peter Brett, my best friend, who you interviewed recently, yeah. um, he came tearing out of the gate. We had been best friends since our last year in high school, or since our first year in college. Um, and he, you know, we've been writing together and critiquing each other's work and encouraging each other. Um, and he just hit it like a meteor. I mean, his career arc is unheard of. Literally right out of the gate into sledgehammer um, author territory. And uh, I was very determined not to be jealous. Um, and I was very determined to join him. Um, so, and... I was also very lucky because at that stage in Pete's life, he had the bandwidth to hang with me and to, and we traded emails every damn day in Iraq. Um, a lot of those emails kept me alive, just talking about what was going on, but also trading chapters back and forth and critiquing each other's work and getting that input. And that really did, but his success really lit a fire under me to get it done. That's actually, that's a really great story. I love it. Um, Good growth experience, too, because, look, when your best friend takes off like a meteor at the very thing you want to do, um, you know, you could, you could get upset about that. A lot of people would. Um, and don't get me wrong, the temptation was strong. Um, uh, but it was a great growth opportunity for me because I was able to stare the potential jealousy in the face and be like, mm -mm. nope, we're not doing that. Um, you know, it's going to hurt him. Right? Yeah. And his success does not detract from mine. A rising tide lifts all boats. That is one of my favorite sayings. It's a true saying. Yeah. Um, and that him being a, a big shot author, that's only going to help me because it helps introduce me to people. It helps. And I also have his attention and his critique. Um, so it was not only um, a fire lit under me to get my first book deal, but also help me be a better person. Did you start writing Shadow Ops before you joined the military or after? Oh, long before. Um, I, I have been writing since I was a kid. Um, my mom got me, uh, again, I feel like such a, a, a withered ancient here. Um, <laughs> my mom got me the Ralph Bakshi animated Lord of the Rings. This is, okay, so when I was little, we listened to music on these things called records. They were made of vinyl. You know they're coming back. They right? were big, they were round, they were flat, and they spun. Anyway. You know they're coming back, they're right? Coming back. No, they're in style again. Oh, really? Do you have any? Uh, there's a bunch downstairs in my apartment. Actually. Oh, man. Okay. 
Yeah. Well, there goes my argument. Uh, hipsters, you know. Yeah, that's right. We're in Brooklyn. They've got and they've got great sound quality. Anyway, your story. <laughs> right, so, um, my mom bought me the Ralph Bakshi animated Lord of the Rings. This was the, you know, it was a cartoon version of Lord of the Rings, long before Peter Jackson ever bought the series. Yeah, I've um, seen some of the stills from that. <laughs> right, and it has. You should watch it. It's worth watching. I mean, it's ridiculous, but it's worth watching. It had liner notes, which was like the script of what all the characters were saying. And I remember, I don't remember how old I was. I was like four or five, but I, maybe I was older. I, I, mom got me that, and I went and asked her for typing paper and a pen, and I went upstairs and I copied the whole damn thing word for word, brought it back down, and gave it to her and said I wrote a book. I don't know <laughs> where that came from. I don't know where that came from, but, but I've always written. Always, 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 always. But the book that became Control Point, I wrote that book four times, stem to stern with only the core concept intact. Um, it was the fourth time that sold and became Control Point. And I think I wrote the first one, oh man, I don't even remember when I finished it. I must have been, you know, in grad school or something, you know, 27, 28. Um, so, uh, so where did that core concept come from? Oh, uh, this is easy. Um, this is, again, nerd, military. Yeah. So at the time, I was working at the Pentagon. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been in the Pentagon. Uh, it's hard to get into now. Before 9-11, anybody can go to the Pentagon. Um, but uh, it's this giant office building. And it is so emblematic of the military bureaucracy. Like, just the office of the assistant, undersecretary, <laughs> deputy boss, you know, whatever. Like, paper just sweating out of walls and people running around on these... <coughs> No yeah. problem. You alright? Yeah. Oh man, I'm sorry about that. Wish I'd warned you. Yeah, it's um, all right. It's, it's fine. Um, so, uh, uh, just people scurrying around on these obviously bullshit tasks, right? That have nothing to do with anything. <laughs> Moving this piece of paper from this office to the other. And I realized in that moment that um, as ridiculous as military bureaucracy is, it's also necessary. Because um, if you're going to have something, look, if you have that degree of violent power, the United States military can snap its fingers and turn a country to ash. Um, so if that's the case, you want that hyper-regularized. You want rules for every little jot and tittle. You want everything to be repeatable, predictable, right? Yeah, um, makes sense. And I thought, and of course because I'm a dork, I thought, well, what if there were elves? What if there was magic? What would they do? And the obvious answer is they would cover it in red tape <laughs> and they would make it so boring that nobody would want to have anything to do with it. Um, and that was the genesis for the idea that became Control Point. Um, well, uh, you already answered this next question, but I'll see if I can rephrase it. Sure. Um, so you've sort of given an idea of how the, the, the plot and the setting, I think, were... Uh, you know, were, I've completely lost the word, uh, <laughs> were, were affected in a way, were, were formed by your experiences. Mm -hmm. um, were the characters brought about by your experiences in any way? Of or? course. Yeah. I mean, um, I've become much more deliberate in my construction of characters over time. But um, I think even then I had an instinct to draw on the flaws of the people around me. I really firmly believe the characters are interesting insofar as they are messed up. Um, perfect people are really kind of boring. Yeah. Um, the uh, with the exception of Pierce Brown. Pierce Brown is perfect, and he's also really really interesting. Um, but he's the only one. Is um, this a real person? Yes, he is the author of the uh, Red Red Rising series. Oh. Uh, the first book of which he called it is Red Rising, which is amazing. Um, but literally, like, he's a perfect human being. The man is utterly without flaw and actually interesting. But other perfect human beings are completely boring. Um, so I'm interested in exploiting uh, and digging into those flaws. If you look at, I don't know, big hits like um, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, I mean, look at every character is more jacked up than the last. Even Ned Stark, who is, you know, the, the, the really the right. one like good guy, he's so high-bound and tied to rules, and he can't even see when they're ripping him up from behind and yeah. it costs him his life. Um, and yeah, you're, you're a big fan of uh, Abercrombie. Yes, I'm a huge fan of Abercrombie. I'm a huge fan of all the grimdark movements of Scott Lynch and Robin Hobb, P. 
Peter V. Brett, um, and uh, <coughs> um, uh, so um, so I drew on the flaws of the people who I saw around me, and on my own flaws, um, and tried to use those for convincing characters. So yes, every single character that appears in any of my books has elements of people I've met. Um, it's the only way I know how to generate them effectively. Well, I'm afraid that that's all the video that YouTube has bandwidth for today. Be sure to tune in on Friday for the second part of our fantastic interview with Mike Cole. If you enjoyed this video, remember to show it by clicking the like button. Click on the dragon here to subscribe, or click here to watch our original review for Mike Cole's The Armored Saint. I will see everyone on Friday, and until then, read good fantasy.